to success. So over to you, Vikram and Aditya. Yeah, uh, Aditya, you can like start up here. Sure, sure. So hi everyone, my name is Aditya, and uh, we'll talk about the Golang scheduler today. So I had this is my first uh, tech talk that I'm going to give. So I had to actually give you a lot, but then I came up with just the Golang scheduler for now. And uh, I thought I, I learned this so I could just share with you what it is and how it is implemented and why do we need it in the first place. So here I'll just share my screen and I'll just present this PPT for you. And I'll just turn my camera off just in case we lose some bandwidth and the network gets choppy. So there we are. My name is Aditya Singh. I'm a software engineer at Priceline. And I've been in the industry for four years, worked across multiple teams, across multiple languages. And um, joining with me is my friend Vikram. He's a developer advocate at Applosix. And uh, we're going to talk about the Go scheduler and uh, how it works. So let me get started. So the questions today we are going to answer with this talk is, why does Golang need to have its own scheduler? And how is the scheduler implemented and why it is implemented in that manner? And honestly, let me confess this. I had to give you a lot of things, but then uh, since this is my first tech talk, I thought I could just keep it short and simple and not mess up with, with a lot of details. Anyway, I got lost in the details by preparing for this talk. And I wanted to give you a lot more, but then I just uh, messed up uh, while preparing. So I came up with something very specific and this talk is going to be relatively shorter. So let's just start with the main meet. So before we proceed further, let's try to understand what's happening in this code snippet. Okay. Now, if you look at line number eight, we are calling this function called API call and passing it some request, right? And we are expecting this thing to run concurrently. Now we have our main code in which we create a channel of type string. And we have a function called API call. This function is responsible to make an HTTP call uh, an, an HTTP API call. And uh, this HTTP call is definitely going to be a blocking call. It is going to block on the network and uh, it's going to take some time to get a response. And once we have the response, we are going to write this response on the channel. And once the response is written on the channel, this response will be further taken for processing on line number nine, right? So the question is, how does this concurrency happen? Like Go routines are not really threads, all right? And this program is run on the operating system. The operating system is totally unaware about what a Go routine is. The operating system doesn't know what Go routines are. So who runs this Go routines? Well, the answer is in short and simple words is we still use threads to run these Go routines. And uh, these threads are nothing but your old operating system, kernel threads. So the, so you can visualize that like this, the operating system has its own threads that we invoke and we assign these go routines to those threads and these go routines run on those threads. So our main code runs on one thread and this go routine runs on another thread, or it could be run by the main thread. I mean, let's, it's just uh, to understand this thing. We need to further understand how the scheduler is implemented. But before understanding how it is implemented, let's understand how it is not implemented, right? The first thing that comes to our mind is we'll create one thread for each Go routine. Now, this design is pretty simplistic and it does guarantee us parallelism, all right? To uh, this Go routine actually wants us to leverage the highest level of concurrency by utilizing all the CPU resources to the max. Like if you have a Quadco machine, Go routine wants you to utilize all the cores if required uh, uh, with most optimality. So if we implement it this way, it does guarantee us parallelism, but there are still problems with this. Like if we say we have uh, say thousands of Go routines, we'll have to create thousands of threads and each thread will be assigned to one of the Go routines. And while, while we do have control over these Go routines, we won't have any control over the threads. Right? Because threads are all controlled by the operating system. They are created, managed, context switched, scheduled, and destroyed by the operating system. We have no control over them. And also for 
doing any sort of execution too many system calls will be required to made that will anyway slow down our entire system and also the last thing that go routine wants us to leverage is we, the go routine uh, basically golang wants us to uh, like create uh, up to a million go routines on a single system they want us to create that freely and still let the program run with utmost efficiency and we see that this this sort of design is definitely not scalable up to a million go routines because this would mean if we create a million go routines we'll have to create a million threads and that will definitely crash your system i mean i had created a program in java and i created a million go routines first of all the app crashed after creating a thousand go threads or so and uh, that's definitely not really possible on this uh, hexa core machine uh, so just imagine what's going to happen on your system this is a mac system by the way so what we do is this is uh, this is something that is definitely possible but not really done because it does give us parallelism but this is not scalable up to a million go routines and also is slow so what so the next idea we come up is using m is to n threading like what does this mean is using less number of threads to achieve same number of con con uh, concurrency basically so if you look at this diagram carefully we have m number of threads and we have n number of go routines where m would be way more than n in uh, ideal situation and in the worst case they they both will be equal to each other so what's happening is we are still creating some number of threads some number of operating system threads and assigning some go routines to those threads one go routine at a time now what this implies is one thread would be responsible for handling some go routines and not just one go routine right in the diagram these go routines colored in blue are those that are currently being run by the threads that are basically in the running state those in those colored green are just de depicting that these threads these go routines are in runnable state and those colored black are just depicting that they might be in blocked state or waiting state so this is the idea because one to one uh, threading doesn't work so we come up with m is to n sort of threading but the question now comes is like threads can be context switched and scheduled by the operating system but who is going to context switch the go routines and who is going to you know schedule these go routines onto these threads so this is the answer to this question is by having our own scheduler so golang has its own scheduler called the go runtime scheduler right so the go runtime scheduler is responsible for multiplexing these go routines onto these operating system threads while operating system threads are still managed and scheduled and context switched by the operating system these millions of go routines that we create they will be totally in our control and will be scheduled by our own scheduler and context switched by our own scheduler now to understand how the scheduler is implemented we should first discuss about the best way to understand it is how uh, the golang community community the golang committee uh, came up with the design of a go runtime scheduler so this is how it happened so to implement a very simplistic go runtime scheduler what we do is we first create a global run queue so this run queue is nothing but a fifo queue basically a first in first out queue which has all the runnable go routines uh now the important point to note is this has only those go routines which are in runnable state that are not being taken by any thread right now and are not in wait wait state right so this is a very simplistic design this global run queue is accessed by all those threads that we create and uh, after accessing this run queue the thread that accessed this run queue picks up one of the runnable go routines and start running it right so this run queue is protected by a mutex for obvious reasons to maintain it's because this run queue is actually a shared resource across multiple threads and we need this run queue to be consistent we do not want the same go routine to be picked up by multiple threads so which is why we protect this run queue with a go routine uh, sorry with a mutex right now this sort of design is fine but then go routine all golang also guarantees us some high level of concurrency right but then what is high level of concurrency that it keeps saying what does this mean so let's imagine this if we have four threads and if all these threads have go routines which have made system calls right 
so system call is basically a blocking call and if all four of these threads are blocked right now so what happens here we have this global run queue which still has runnable go routines now what golang wants uh, is that all if there are runnable go routines to be run it wants them to be run right now and it doesn't want it to wait till some thread frees up because once these system calls are made so we do not have any visibility over there right we do not know what's happening in the system we do not know when the system will return or will it return ever so what we want is we still want these runnable go routines that are present in this global run queue to be run so what is the solution to this problem the solution to this problem is as soon as a thread enters a system call it awakens another thread that accesses this global run queue and picks up a runnable go routine right now what happens what does unparking means let's say we have a thread t1 who was running a go routine now this go routine entered a system call so as the go routine entered the system call it unparks another thread now what does unparking mean say we have uh, so in golang when a thread is created it is never destroyed till the app app life cycle it is uh, once the use is over it simply parks that thread it simply parks that thread you can imagine it as a thread pool of unlimited size and uh, whenever a thread is created and is, its utilization is over it gets parked in that pool right and uh, when this go routine enters a system call what t1 does is it checks that pool and if sees if there are any parked threads it unparks that thread and that thread now accesses the global run queue and sees if it has any runnable go routine so it picks up that runnable go routine so in the previous slide we had four threads entering system call each thread would unpark a new thread and if new thread is not parked in the pool it spawns a new thread you see it's when it spawns a new thread so we still run into another uh, problem that is the number of threads that we create would definitely at one point be way more than the cpu cores that we have let's say we are running on a quad core machine and we keep getting into system calls so our threads will be uh, creating spawning new threads every time a system call is being hit and these threads will be accessing this runnable go routine now this does guarantee us parallelism and also guarantee us high level of concurrency but then we now have a lot of threads that are not destroyed and parked right so what how these threads are still useful we'll discuss later and now what happens when a system call exists in the previous slide we saw that uh, the go routine entered a system call and it spawned a new thread right now let's imagine that we are running a quad core machine and we already have four threads that are running on each cpu logical core right so once this go routine had entered a system call and all the cpu cores are now occupied so if this go routine system call returns right we cannot simply assign that go routine to this thread t1 why the reason being if all the cpu cores are already occupied this t1 thread will not have a processor to run this go routine so what we instead do is we push this go routine back in the global run queue as simple as that so this t1 now becomes idle and it gets parked in the thread pool again right and this go routine is back in the global run queue and if another thread gets idle or uh, yeah so it then accesses this global run queue and picks up go routines in fifo manner just as simple now this is how system calls were handled but now let's see how channel io calls are handled let's say one of the go routine is waiting for a channel response right we have a thread t and if you see this blue color go routine which is in running state it is now going to be waiting for some channel response right so what happens here this is still a blocking call because you never know when the channel response will come so this go routine is now put into a wait queue of the channel object this channel has an object of itself and this object has a wait queue of itself what happens is whenever a go routine wants to write to some channel which does not have a receiver or it wants to receive from some channel which does not have any other go routine writing to it this it becomes a blocking call and this go routine enters into this wait queue of the channel object and what happens when the channel uh, waiting is over let's say some waiting go routine got some channel response or some go routine that had written to the channel uh, that message has been received by some other go routine what happens then well it's just simple as that 
the go routine from this wait queue is picked up and put into this global run queue again and other idle threads that uh, were uh, if there are idle threads they'll just pick those go routine up in that regular p4 manner this is how uh, io calls are handled so we discussed system calls and we also discussed how io calls are handled now hey um, aditya just so clarification in the previous slide um so this global run queue and the channel object right um when you say channel io mm -hmm. uh, the channel is not something which is writing on to disk and thing mm -hmm. like that right it's all in memory correct right yeah it's all in memory it's all in memory yeah uh, when i say channel io i basically mean that it's either writing to some channel or it's receiving from some channel that's it it's not sending and receiving yeah that's right that's right nothing more complicated okay all right. and um one more question so regarding the channel object so i know that channels do so um do have a queue or rather kind of like a w linked list of the number of core teams which are waiting or to send or receive from that particular channel mm -hmm. so those go routines are they actually removed from the global run queue uh, from the global run queue uh, i'm sorry can you repeat again so the question here is are the go routines like the running the non running or the go routines which are blocked on channel uh -huh. either sending or receiving are they removed from the global run queue uh well uh, they are they are not removed from the global run queue so what happens here is uh, say one of the go routine gets unblocked from the channel right so they come out of that channel's wait queue and they are put back on the uh, global run queue if that's what i'm saying and uh, it is then picked up so you mean they they get removed because the channel must have been running earlier right sorry the go routine must have been running earlier right which would have made it uh, been running in the run queue so it would have been removed to be placed in the channel object uh well, there well uh, okay let me let me again explain this very pretty in very in a simpler language so what's happening here is if the go routine is running and it is blocking for some channel io right and it is it is put on the wait queue now what happens when the go routine is unblocked right when it uh, it is uh, if it was expecting for some channel receive and it got that receive or if it was expecting to write on some channel and it got a receiver then it has to be unblocked so it has to be picked out of this channel's wait queue right so after it is pick, picked out of the wait queue it is put back inside this global run queue and not assigned back to the original thread and if there are other idle threads waiting they will pick up these runnable go routines from this global run queue in that regular fifo fashion so basically all these waiting threads from the wait queue uh, their state changes from waiting to runnable and that go routine is put back in the uh, global run queue this is what i mean uh, do did i answer your question? did i answer your question fair enough yep perfect 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 all right so moving ahead now this thing sounds good but it doesn't scale now why doesn't it scale let's say this single global run queue we have this thing is causing problems here because every time a thread goes into a system call it is spawning a new thread right with this thing let's imagine some code in which there are thousands of go routines right and every go routine is getting into a system call maybe all of them are trying to read some file or maybe trying to get some hit some network io operation so they are all essentially making system calls or let's say they are all entering some system call which is waiting for some semaphore or some mutex right so with this we are spawning thousands of threads at the same time now what happens is the if if say we have a thousands of cores in the future right we will be running thousands of threads in parallel let's not talk about thousands but let's say we have hundreds of threads uh, cores in the future maybe so all these hundreds of threads will be running in parallel so these threads will be accessing this global run queue at the same time and they will all be blocked at the mutex level this will slow down our application right so all these threads will be contending for this mutex the the rate of contention will be way too high just because of this mutex object 
so to solve this problem to solve this scalability problem so that this thing this scalability is timeless and scales with hundreds and thousands of cores also in the future what they've done is every thread is assigned now to a local run queue of its own now we still have the global run queue all right but they are present for very specific cases and which we will discuss later now this is just as simple as that every thread has its own local run queue and every local run queue will have some go routines and that is it we still have the global run queue but for very specific reasons threads will be accessing go routines only from their local run queue for now that's it this is how the scalability issue is solved but what happens when the local run queue is out of go routines say this is the order where uh, and in which the threads look for runnable go routines first it looks for runnable go routines in the local run queue if there are runnable go routines in the local run queue they are run otherwise then it checks for runnable go routines in the global run queue this is why we still have the global run queue but when are go routines put in the global run queue that's the question that might have come in your mind we'll discuss that later so first things first it looks for runnable go routines in the local run queue then it looks for runnable go, go routines in the global run queue in case there are no more go routines in the local run queue now what happens when there are no go routines in the global run queue as well so it starts polling the network it starts polling network to check if we have any uh, go routines uh, to be able to run so i won't get into details of this polling the network uh, otherwise that will deviate the entire topic of go scheduler and finally if there are no go routines uh, being uh, that are in runnable state on the uh, network it steals work from other threads right if we go back to the previous thread let's say t1 has has three go routines for now and it has done execution of all the go routines it has no more go routines to run it pulls the global run queue it ran all the four go routines as well now the local run queue is also empty the global run queue is also empty it pulled the network it did not find any go routines now what happens it starts stealing go routines from local run queue of t2 and t3 that's it it starts stealing work well for us it might sound as stealing something is bad but not really this actually increases the high level of concurrency to a higher level basically this makes it cooperative it's just as simple as let's say i and vikram are working on some project and uh, vikram is blocked on something and i am now free i have done my tasks now what i'll do is to save time because we are working as a team to save time i'm going to pick up some tasks tasks from vikram and start executing those tasks it's just as simple as that i'm stealing tasks from vikram that's it so if say t2 is out of uh, these go routines and uh, i'm sorry for this mistake but just imagine that this global run queue also does not have any go routines and uh, the network pole has, has also returned empty so it starts pulling <clears throat> the local run queues of t1 and t3 to check if they have any go routines available for execution in runnable state so t2 will pick up that go uh, pick up the entire run entire local run queue of t1 or t3 whichever it finds first and will start executing those and let's say t2 picked up the local run queue of t1 now and uh, t2 started executing one by one uh, go routines one by one and meanwhile t1 has completed executing its go routine now t1 doesn't have any uh, go routines to run in its local run queue and let's imagine that global run queue is also empty now t1 will start uh, doing the stealing it will go go and look for uh, runnable jobs in the run queues of t2 and t3 let's say it found uh, runnable jobs in t3 it's going to pick up the local run queue of t3 and start executing that this is how cooperation happens and this is how work stealing happens and uh, <clears throat> this is what uh, taking high level of concurrency to a higher level means this is work stealing but then what happens is let's say at scale right we created a thousand threads because let's say all the threads were blocked in a system call so what happens here is let's say t2 is out of runnable go routines and we have a thousand threads available so t2 would now 
check uh, keep polling the local run queue of every other thousand threads at this time right and uh, that's pretty inefficient and we do not want to do this again and again once or twice is fine but then thread uh, threads do run out of runnable go routines every now and then and uh, imagine doing this at scale imagine polling thousands of threads again and again ch to check if they have runnable go routines and uh, i won't get into much detail about this point but in practical situations these local run queues are most of the times empty in practical situations if the go if the code is written in a very uh, good manner right so this thing is pretty inefficient <clears throat> right so what do we do to solve this inefficiency we do not want a thread to be polling thousands of threads at the same time again and again and this because this will in the end slow down our system so we have we now introduce m is to p is to n threading right so what does this what does this mean we still have m number of threads we still have n number of go routines where these let's say these go routines may be at the scale of a million right now we introduce p objects where p is just a processor and this p will always be equal to the number of cpu cores we have in for for the sake of this diagram we can imagine that we are running a dual core machine right so we have two processor objects here and we still have a million go routines and the color coding still means the same the green go routines are in runnable state the blue ones are taken by the processor and the black ones are waiting for in the system call <clears throat> right so now what happens is this thread thread holds on to a processor object and this processor object now has the runnable go routine basically in this diagram i have shown that processor is pointing to a go routine but technically what happens is the local run queue of this thread is now the local run queue of the processor this is how it is thread doesn't have a local run queue but the processor object now has the local run queue right so this t2 is assigned to a processor t4 is assigned to another processor let's say t3 is idle it is not assigned to any processor t1 has a go routine but it is blocked in a system call and so is t5 right t2 picks up some go routine from the the run queue of the processor assigned to it and starts running so, and so does t4 this is how it looks like now the processor has the run queue run queues have runnable go routines and the threads are taking over a processor object and picking up go routines from those processor objects and uh, if they run out of uh, go runnable go routines in their run queue they'll pull the global run queue we still have the global run queue with the mutex law right <clears throat> so this is how it is applied to our scheduler now how does the stealing happen let's say t3 is idle right now what happens is in the previous case before we had these m is to p is to n threading when we had just m is to n threading what happened was when this t3 was idle and it had when we had around thousands of threads so this would poll those thousands of threads now we will just poll p number of processors and that's it we do not have to poll thousands of threads so this is scalable and also efficient because these processors would be equal to the number of cpu cores and that's it so what happens is when t3 is empty it will start stealing jobs from other threads say we are running on a dual core machine we'll have two processor objects and t3 will be polling p1 and p2 to check if they have runnable go routines let's say t3 found runnable go routines in p1 so what it does is since t2 is already running some go routine it will steal the entire p1 object from t3 from t2 now imagine this right now t2 has hold of p1 but after t3 stole it this link of t2 to p1 is out and t3 now holds p1 and now t3 starts picking up go runnable go routines from the run queue of p1 that's it this is how higher level of cooperation happens that is checklist steal mode what does checklist means that we do not have to check across thousands of threads now threads now we just have to check across p number of processors and we uh, this uh, rate of stealing increases in less time because for the same reason we do not have to check across thousands of threads okay <clears throat> now this is still very efficient but we can take this high level of concurrency even higher and how does that happen through this handoff mechanism right 
now in the previous slide we saw that t2 was holding on to p1 okay now let's say the go routine that t2 was running has entered a system call now because t2 knows that the go routine has made a system call what it is going to do is it's not going to wait for some other thread to come and steal its processor object rather it itself will look for idle threads for parked threads uh, to check if there are any free threads that could be taking up my processor let's say i uh, or let me give you an analogy let's say i'm working on i've got like 10 things to do and uh, let's say i want to go buy groceries but i'm stuck with my office work so i just call my brother and ask him to go buy groceries this is just that t2 is holding on to p1 it's running into a go routine but that go routine is stuck with a system call it's just going to call its brother i mean it's just going to call some other free thread and just hand over that p1 object to that new thread in this case it's just going to call that idle t3 and it's just going to hand over p1 object to that three t3 now t3 starts picking up go routines from the run queue of p1 and starts running those go routines one by one and the same thing happens when the system call exists when the system call exists it's going to put this go routine into the global run queue and that global run queue will be pulled in that regular fifo manner because it t2 doesn't have access to p1 anymore so this go routine is put in the global run queue and uh, this is how it happens now work stealing was one thing and handing off coupling it with handoff we increase the level of concurrency to a very high level with this now i'll hand over this talk to vikram he will uh, talk about how fairness is implemented with go routines i'm done with it vikram over to you brother yeah. uh, thanks aditya uh, like has aditya explained on your own i'll no, just like, stop sharing no no all right no no uh, it's fine yeah all right so uh, thanks aditya like uh, has uh, aditya explained how you can achieve a good level of concurrency with uh, efficiency uh, and parallelism within the go, uh, with with the use of this go routine now uh, after like uh, learning how this implementation has been done it all uh, comes over to the fairness so what exactly is fairness is so when uh, assume like uh, it's a property of scheduler which make sure that uh, every runnable go routine should run eventually so for example has a detail explained uh, there is always a fifo queue where uh, numbers of go routines are lined up in order to uh, get uh, used to the thread like threads can uh, any time a go routine can be fetched and uh, it can be run on the threads right similarly uh, when uh, it comes to fairness it makes sure that uh, the go routines which are in waiting stage or uh, which which are ready to run Uh, our run has uh, like as soon as possible without any uh, spending much more time on that. So that's what like fairness comes. So it also look after like uh, how this go routine uses these resources, uh, CPU resources, and make sure that it uh, achieve a good level of concurrency and efficiency. That's what like uh, the fairness is uh, in the go routine. but why why do we need this kind of fairness if we have achieved everything then uh, why this uh, questions come like what is the need of this fairness one is bad tail latency that uh, that is equal to starvation uh, starvation that is like uh, assume a go routine which has been waiting for uh, his turn uh, from long from a long time for example a sequence where uh, only few go routines uh, have started and uh, like they have not yet came uh, to an end after the system call so what's the end of that uh, because since they have not uh, came to an end other go routines are suffering because they are not getting that kind of cpu resources or thread to get started uh, with their process that's what like ba uh, bad tail latency uh, is all about it's all about the starvation that uh, a go routine want to run but uh, is not able to get because they are already occupied uh, because previous go routines are already occupied uh, and cpu uh, or threads have been used by those uh, go routines so second part is like live log now live log is uh, like equal to perfection you can say for example if you are looking for a weather a weather forecast so whenever you look after a weather forecast and uh, you search some city or something you will always land up to uh, a precise not very much precise but it will always update uh, like uh, 
the current uh, weather is this uh, this thing and uh, whenever you like switch on to the different one uh, again that uh, data changes like the updates are getting more precise to that particular point which is what like live log is all about third part is like unknown behavior so uh, with with respect to fairness uh, obviously like uh, the minimal fairness comes with the minimal cost i would say so unknown uh, behavior is just like uh, let's assume we have a fifo queue there uh, the go routines are always like stacked up one after the another and always like uh, it 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 is used or uh, it uses the thread of process uh, like the first first in first out phases where uh, it it makes sure that everything scheduling and all goes in a proper way whereas in a, which is always like called as a fair scheduling and when it comes to the next one like in the lifo part uh, the the stacked up go routines are uh, like not used directly i would say uh, the the last one that entered is always uh, spawned up or used by the thread and the other uh, go routines below that uh, suffers like uh, the starve uh, for the resources that's what like uh, i can say uh, it's not that fair uh, scheduling in that case similarly there are many more cases where this unknown behavior can uh, pitch up when we talk about uh, this fairness kind of thing and uh, currently i will not like uh, move on to much more depth because it's a it's a vast topic where uh, actually Uh, we can dig up some uh, go scheduling code and find out like how exactly it uh, it pull up uh, some go routines from the local run queue and how uh, this uh, global run queue can uh, set up and what's the actual number they have used in order to pick up these go routines so there is a good uh, competition or mathematics around that that why should a uh, number 61 should be used why not uh, like 64 so there are many more questions which can extend this talk to like more than uh, like one or the half hour so here yeah, i will like to stop myself uh, with this in order to like make sure that what and why uh, this fairness should be there in go routine and uh, like we can just close up here and again we can come up with in more detail with this fairness kind of thing yeah uh, like thanks thanks everyone and it uh, like if you have some uh, more details you can like Uh, sure, sure, Vikram. So the entire uh, intention behind giving this talk on the Go scheduler is like we still have a lot of Go programmers in the market uh, who do not understand how Go scheduler works, and uh, they also end up crashing the entire Go code. Uh, in and then like they would create a million of Go routines that Go Go Lang promises us to uh, that it will function without any hassles. but they still end up crashing the code and then they start thinking that golang is not efficient or anything it's just that they do not understand how go scheduler works as the famous saying goes a good hacker and a bad coder can crash absolutely anything so it's just that so the intention for uh, this talk was for everyone to know how the go scheduler is implemented and the how things work in the background so this would help you to implement your go code with much more efficiency and uh, write better code that was it and that was a great talk about fairness vikram uh, thank you so much so this was it if you have any questions please let us know we are open to take questions from you hello all is there very much here yeah i have a question like uh, can we control or uh, thread pooling or uh, Like for example, we have SQL pooling, right? We can control the number of SQL connections. Mm -hmm. So can we control thread pooling in Go? Okay, okay. Let me talk about this. So there is a limit called Go Max Prox. Okay. Now what does Go Max Prox is? This is the number of threads that you can run, but not really. So Go Max Prox is the number of threads that will be run at a time. that will be handling one go routine at a time that is what it means this does not mere include the those threads that are blocked in the system calls this does not include the unparked threads sorry the parked threads go max prox simply means that i will be running these number of go routines where at a time that will be there will be these number of go routines at a time which will be running go uh, sorry uh, i'm sorry uh, go max prox means there will be Go max prox number of threads running go routines at a time. 
that is it you can definitely configure that but to understand it with more clarity it doesn't mean that there will be only those number of threads existing it means that there will be only those number of threads running go routines at a time so you can set that limit to say if you have four cores you can set it to four but you can still create a thousand your program can still create thousands of threads because your thread might get blocked on system call and it will just spawn another thread to see if there are other go routines waiting to run so yes it is definitely configurable that how many threads will be running go routines at a time but then yeah it is still definitely possible to create a thousands of threads at the same time Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, from the perspective of a thread pool and other languages, let's say .NET or uh, even Java, uh, the reason uh, those uh, languages have a thread pool is because they map to a direct OA thread and OA thread are expensive. They'll have their own stack and uh, it's basically heavy. But mm -hmm. in GoLang, uh, Go routines are cheap. Uh, so uh, we, we, I mean, uh, there is really no need to maintain the uh, go routine so that we can reuse it. We can create as many as we want, and uh, once they are done, they are going to be destroyed. So uh, yeah, if your, your question is from that perspective, we don't need a, uh, a go routine or thread pool uh, here. Um, but otherwise, what are the thank you? Shin. Does that answer your question? Yep. All right. More questions? Aditya, do you have do you have a few examples of the kind of system calls which which actually create Go routines which block threads mm -hmm. which the Go Max Prox doesn't control? Oh uh, well, that could be anything from file I/O. Well, uh, I haven't really tested uh, this thing. But then I'm just making a guess over here. Those system calls could be anything like uh, like some file I/O, or maybe those uh, uh, Linux level calls like uh, epoll wait. That's basically done for network calls, or maybe some semaphore it is waiting for, right? So okay, we can even run into this situation. Like let's say we have ten threads, and right, and they are all blocked for a system call, and they are all uh, all these system calls are waiting for some semaphore to be released. And the semaphore that uh, the go routine that will release the semaphore is in the running queue, is in the is in a, in the runnable state in some of the local runs, right? So what happens is uh, because they are in the system call, uh, they are blocked in the system call. They will spawn a new thread that will either steal or they will hand over their process to this new thread, and this new thread will run that go routine that will block this semaphore. And then these go routines will be put back. These blocked go routines will get hold of that semaphore and will continue their execution. So what you're saying basically is, if I have twenty go routines which are opening a file at the same time, right? Um, irrespective of what my value of go max prox is, it would create twenty threads. That's right. That's right. So if you set it to four. But because this go max prox is basically what it means is these are the number of threads that will be running go routines at the same time, and this is not basically the number of threads that will be created at the max. This is just the number of threads that will be running go routines at a time. That's it. So only if you've set this to five, five threads will be holding that uh, will be holding go routines at a time, while you can still have fifteen other idle thread. Uh, sorry. Parked threads or threads waiting in a system call. Mm, interesting. Okay. Aditya, uh, is there any control provided to the uh, the developer uh, that they can leverage if you want to tweak or fine tune the scheduling? Um, is there any 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 kind of a control provided by the runtime? Uh, in like, for example, with the pair scheduling. So uh, Vikram talked about fair scheduling, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any way I can control that scheduling itself of the go routines? Um, like probably with the um, round robin way of um, scheduling those go routines itself, like to avoid starvation, can I control, let's say, the duration a go routine runs for or any sort of parameter? Sure, sure. Uh, so I'm not sure if this thing is configurable. Maybe there might be some flag. But then what happens is, 
say one thread is running a go routine for 10 milliseconds which is definitely a soft limit the scheduler would preempt this go routine from that thread and put it in the global run queue right it won't let that go routine run for more than 10 milliseconds that is how golang right now handles fairness otherwise it might keep running forever and it will starve other go routines right so this is how uh, maybe we can change this with some flag that i am not really aware of right now we can pass in some flag to the go runtime uh, that would change this 10 milliseconds to say 15 milliseconds or maybe just 5 milliseconds but then this is how uh, the go scheduler preempts the long running go routines and puts them in the uh, global run queue does that answer the question Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, so I kind of hijacked your question. I hope that was your question. No, no, as well. that's exactly what I wanted to ask also. So awesome. basically, I I seen and uh, I mean there is a entire uh, discipline of uh, tuning Java scheduler. So there are so many parameters that you can tweak and uh, you can control how your uh, thread should be scheduled. Uh, I was just wondering if there anything similar available for us. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, in fact, to learn more about this thing, you know, uh, Golang scheduler, uh, Golang scheduler is an open source project. I can share you the link uh, after we end the talk. Share the link with you of the source code. Uh, I mean, everything is written in the comments about how things are implemented uh, and why they are implemented in that manner. I mean, honestly, not everything is uh, talked about about why things are implemented because. When I talked about local run queues and global run queues, no. So what uh, these these threads do is <clears throat> they keep running, uh, polling their local run queue, and if local run queues do not run out of Go routines to run, they'll never poll the global run queue. In uh, about uh, if we talk about uh, our previous slides, but what really happens is uh, there is a schedule ticker that's basically just a counter, and uh, it keeps ticking every time these local run queues are hit. These local run queues are polled. And when this counter reaches a multiple of 61, no, then instead of polling the local run queue, it polls the global run queue first. So why 61 exactly? Well, I'm not really sure of the reason. One of the reason could be that it is a prime number, but then I'm not really sure about why 61. And that thing is not even mentioned in the source code that why they chose 61, but they have they are choosing 61. If the scheduler counter is is a multiple of 61, they'll pull the global run queue first before pulling their local run queues, just so that the global run queue doesn't starve. So there are things in the source code which do not have an explanation within the source code. We'll have to dig in further. But then you can definitely learn more about this thing from the source code itself. A lot of the code is self-descriptive pretty much. And uh, yeah, there are lots of comments in the code itself. Hey, um, sorry, I missed the part about 61. What yeah. exactly is that number? Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah so basically uh, what this 61 is, so they, they, actually like we were, while we were doing the research, we find some videos around that and, and like I picked up this uh, scheduler code. So we found out like um, instead of using uh, any else number, they use 64 because of three reasons. That is, they don't want the number to be too small and they don't want the number to be too big and they made sure that uh, the number should be prime. The reason because, uh, for example, if uh, some number they are using is like uh, 64, then 64 is just like uh, the power of two. So if you if you check out like many applications and uh, many, many softwares that are directly built on any of these uh, system languages, they are directly uh, mapped to this 64 or multiples of eight or two. That's what like first reason. So uh, whenever these go routines uh, of the system call or uh, any application gets uh, mapped with this, uh, this go routine, then uh, it should not get a conflict between those two. First, first reason was that. And 61 was very near to 64. Uh, and they had some kind of picture like uh, if they use 64, which is power of two, they uh, the and if it's a hash map kind of thing, then obviously like uh, at the every eight uh, bits there is a conflict and it will probably uh, overflow some kind of uh, 
uh, some kind of thing, uh, some kind of data there. But if you if you are using sixty one, the uh, the probability of getting the conflict gets very lower, and with respect to whatever they were getting in sixty four. So has has Aditya has uh, like. Highlighted the code. They don't have the exact reason here, but uh, had we digged up and watched few videos, this was some kind of reason we got from them. Yeah. Right. So uh, got it, got it. source code on line number three thousand three hundred and forty-one. You can see that if this shed tick counter after incrementing, if it is a multiple of what is shed tick? Uh, it's just the counter. Schedule tick. Huh? It's a uh, every time. It's a variable name is schedule tick. Yeah, schedule. Yeah, it's just a counter variable, and every time this local run queue is, uh, yeah, every time one of the queues is uh, pulled, this counter increments, and once this counter oh, okay. is below sixty one, it then uh, on if you see line number three thousand three hundred and fifty, it first pulls the global run queue. It acquires the mutex of that global run queue. You see this, then pulls the global run queue, and then unblocks the. Unlocks the mutex of that global run queue. So this is the reason. All it says is check the global run queue once in a while. Now this is the point to highlight once in a while, and for them once in a while is a multiple of sixty one. Just to ensure fairness. Otherwise, do go root and completely occupy the local run queue by constantly respawning it. They haven't really mentioned the reason why sixty one, but just that. Yeah, just a number. Yeah, just watch the few videos and one of the Magic videos number. talks about this sixty one. That's all. Yeah, that's good actually. Uh -huh. Yeah, more questions? Um, I have just shared a link on chat. Um, so this one just talks about the Gaussian. Um, I think this points to um Shiva's question earlier. Like from any Go routine, you can actually make a call to this runtime dot Gaussian. And it tells the Go scheduler that hey, this particular Go routine can yield itself. Mm -hmm. um, that is, you can sort of. Um, I've done enough work. It's like a programmer thing that you're saying to the Go scheduler that hey, I've done enough work. You can actually schedule me out if some of the Go routine wants to run. Mm -hmm. So you do have slight control over when a scheduling, like when you can have. Another go schedule run, but this is not guaranteed always. But it's good to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, inter interesting um, tidbits from the past. Before the preemptive scheduling that was introduced to Go, I think a uh, few years back, uh, if you uh, have a for loop that iterates continuously, this is the only way you can yield the control back to uh, the scheduler. So mm -hmm. this was way back uh, when uh, the OS thread was one. We had to explicitly set the Mac uh, prop. Uh, I was uh, I wrote a program that continues. It's a tight loop, and uh, I was wondering why my Go returns are not getting executed. Then after some digging, I realized that uh, because at that time Go scheduler was not preemptive, so it preempts on uh, on a IO calls. Uh, so then I took all this to yield the control back to the scheduler. But now, I mean, this is a moot point uh, because uh, go, uh, go runtime address this. It's become mm -hmm. preemptive. Yeah. Great point. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, this Go routine basically sounds conceptually very similar to threads and coroutines. Coroutines are basically multiplexed over threads. So Go routines are conceptually similar. And uh, it's just that uh, there there are languages like Java, which do not uh, implement coroutines as of now. But there is this uh, project Loom coming up, and uh, it is in uh, beta beta phase right now, which is going to be a part of JDK. It is still a part of JDK, but not really production ready. Which uh, has introduced uh, thread fibers. Uh, they call it Java fibers or thread fibers, I think. So they are very similar to these Go routines. They will be multiplexed over threads, and they will also, yeah, they also claim to guarantee high level of concurrency, just like Go routines does. So across multiple languages, uh, Go routines have a competitor coming up soon called Project Loom in Java. Right now, uh, it's not prod ready. Just letting you know, that's all. More questions. <clears throat>
well i think this is great all right I thanks hope. aditya thanks vikram so thank you so much thank you all of you for being such a great audience those were some very amazing questions very mind challenging and if you have more questions you can contact us on our email ids uh, you can take a screenshot if you want and uh, these are our private email ids and uh, i'll definitely respond <clears throat> as quick as possible if i know the answer to your queries and if i don't then i'll definitely do some research and get back to you in some time and uh, i hope you got to learn something new today <laughs> and i'm really sorry if you already knew all the things uh, <laughs> that's all thank you so much everyone by the way chennai um, does have a slack channel on the coco um, slack so you can feel free to join that as well both atya vikram as well as adus oh sure yeah we are not too active but it's good to be there um like we do i think the same i forgot to post the meet up information of there sorry i had a lot of things uh do not but yeah okay. how can i join the channel what if can i add a channel um there's a there's a glo global gophers um slack Yes. I think I'll send you the. Give me one second. I'll. I think it's up on the meetup page as well. Give me one second. Well, if you can see my screen, I have the Slack open. I am in the Gophers channel. Ah, yeah. So you can um just go for Control T, uh, Command T, and search for Chennai. Chennai. Yep, that's all. Is this the one? chennai um i think you hit the second one the first one was the chennai chan all right you see the hash right next to it right yeah, yeah this that's one. it oh is this the one all right perfect i'll join yeah. the chan so like that you have other cities as well but chennai is the one which we are using for our meetup perfect perfect thank you so much gaurav um, so that's pretty much it